Hello everyone, it's Professor Fiore, and in today's video, we are going to look at another way of creating a phase splitter. So a quick reminder, phase splitter is a device with one input, two outputs. The first output is ideally the exact same phase as the input. The other output is an anti-phase. In other words, 180 degrees out of phase, it's an inverted version of the input signal. These magnitudes you would like to be perfectly matched, exact same magnitude, the only difference being the phase. You might have a gain, a net gain here. It might be unity gain, could be a gain of 10, all depends on the application. Um, ideally, this will have a high input impedance. These outputs will be low impedance. It will be able to tolerate an unbalanced load, meaning that these lines as they go out to, you know, whatever it is they're driving, those two values, if they're identical, are balanced. If they're different, that's unbalanced. So it's an advantage if it can tolerate an unbalanced load, but if you know what the load is and it is balanced, well, you know, we're not going to count that as a strike. Ideally, it should have a wide bandwidth and a low distortion. Remember, this is a differential uh, drive signal, so what ends up happening is this cable would be wrapped around itself. These two signal conducting cables would be twisted around each other, and then there would be an outside shield. In other words, this is a twisted pair coax. So the noise that would be coming in from out here, transient noise, hum, whatever it is, it would be induced in these lines in phase, and the differential amplifier on the far end, which is sort of the mirror image of the phase splitter simply takes the difference, right? Its output is the positive input minus the negative input. If those two things are identical, they perfectly cancel and you get no output. But because our driving signal is an anti-phase, for example, if this was a sine wave, you'd have sine minus a minus sine, which is two sine, and you get a nice big signal, right? So this will handle noise that's coming in through this cable. Right. doesn't do anything about noise back here, but noise that's coming in over here. So induced noise in the form of hum or transients, things like this. So where does it find a lot of use? Pro Audio is one example. All right. So when you take a look at a microphone, it'll have three pins on it. All right. You have a ground pin, you have the hot or in-phase lead, and then you have the anti-phase lead, which is sometimes referred to as neutral. All right. Okay. So what does our circuit look like? Now, if you didn't see the first part of this video, the first part is under the semiconductor devices playlist, and that used a single transistor, you know, one output on the collector and one, out, one output on the emitter, right? So it's like two of them stuck together. So what do we have now? Well, it's a bit more complicated. I've got a differential amplifier out here. So the diff amp, will supply an output on each collector. Down here, if you haven't seen all the diff amp videos, you might want to take a look at that. But down here we have a current source. And it turns out having a high quality current source is very important. So as far as the phases are concerned, if we have an input phase, in other words, I have a sine wave that kind of looks like this coming in, right? on the same collector, which I happen to be calling V load number one, you would get the anti-phase. You would get a minus sine wave. On the opposite collector, you would get an in-phase signal. All right, so that's the kind of phase you would be looking at. Excuse the poor drawing, but that's the kind of phase you would be looking at. So again, ideally, we'll have the same exact amplitudes out of the things. The only thing that will be different will be that phase. Okay. All right, so... We can take a look at the uh, current source down here in just a sec, but reminding what's happening with the amplifier. So if you go back and look at your diff amp calculations that, you know, we did a while back, um, you find out that looking at the same collector, you have an output that's equal to a negative RC over 2 R prime E plus RE, that quantity, right? So if I'm on this input, right, I'm calling this number one, transistor number one. So that's the AC value for RC1, which would be the biasing resistor in parallel with 
our load number one, and then two times the quantity r prime e of this, okay? And ideally, these things would be matched, right? You would, you would have these two DC currents identical, so the two r prime e's would be the same. Um, and then whatever the AC emitter resistance is. Okay, so I've got a swapping resistor down here, RE number one. And then of course, we'd have to have the impedance looking into emitter number two. And then if we looked at the opposite collector, the equation is essentially the same, except that there's no inversion, right? There's no minus sign. And we're using uh, collector resistor number two, right? So these two rather than, um, excuse me, these two rather than this one and this one, all right? off of collector number two, and of course the RE and the R prime for this transistor. But like I said, we would normally design this in such a way that it's perfectly symmetrical. RC1 and RC2 are the same, RE1 and RE2 are the same, the current would split evenly, so R prime E1 and R prime E2 would be the same. <gasps> okay, so what ends up happening? You get identical gains, okay, except for the phase. Unlike the simple single transistor version, this thing can have an actual true gain greater than one. You can get a gain of, you know, five or 10 or, you know, whatever the heck you design it for, okay? The other thing that the uh, simple version had going against it was that the input impedance turned out to be a function of one of the loads, right? The, our load number two, the signal that was hanging off of the emitter uh, that could actually affect the input impedance. So here that will not be the case. Right? So let's take a look at the DC and then we can dive into the AC and see what's going on here. So I have a, a decent quality current source over here and I am going to show you what happens if you just use a cheesy little resistor negative power supply, you know, which is so commonly seen in textbooks. Um, there is a downside to doing that. It's simple, but performance will suffer. So what we have set up over here is a little Zener diode, which will lock in a nice potential across this base emitter and our tail. So this is roughly a 5.1 volt Zener, right, for how we've biased it. So we're going to get, you know, 7 tenths across transistor number three over here, the tail current transistor. And um, when you subtract that out, you know, you're, you're looking at like 4.4 uh, .4 volts or something like that, sitting across our tail. That's a 1.1K, so that should give you about 4 milliamps of current, which would split evenly on both sides. In other words, 2 milliamps this way, 2 milliamps this way. Okay, so that'll put our two collectors DC at somewhere around 10 volts. Now, you might be wondering what the heck is going on over here, right? Well, this little combo is here to make sure that the, both the AC and the DC equivalents off this base, base number two, are identical to what they are over here on base number one. Yes, you could just drop in a 12K resistor here and call it a day so that it would match this bias. The DC biases would be identical, but the AC would not be, right? The AC, when you look back from this point, when you look back this way, the AC impedance is whatever this X sub C plus the 50 ohms in parallel with 12K is. So I wanna put the same thing out here. So these two things are as close to identical as we can get them, all right? So yes, you could leave this off, but you will suffer a little bit in terms of overall performance. All right, so let's do a DC analysis and uh, verify that we are getting, you know, the sorts of things we expect. Alrighty, so move this up just a little bit. Yeah, I think that's enough actually. Okay, so uh, tail current, we're getting 3.959, virtually four mils as we expected. That's what we expected to see, you know, half of that in each of these. So there's 1.959 or 1.959 for that one. That looks good. Uh, we're getting 10.79 for that collector and 10.79 for that collector. Okay, so the DC looks good. We have the current we expect, the voltages we expect. Happy, happy, joy, joy. All right, so if I have a couple of milliamps, that would imply that we're going to get, oh, what, 13-ish ohms for the R prime. So we have 
about 213 on each of these emitters, right, for the RE plus RE. Your RC value, 2K in parallel at 4.7. So that's going to give you, I don't know, 1.4, 1.5K, somewhere, somewhere around there. You divide that out, right, you got your 213 times 2, so that's, you know, 426. And you're looking at, you know, 3 and change, okay? Um, let's go in and do a quick transient analysis and see if that makes sense. Now, I've got a 300 millivolt source, as you can see right down here, 300 millivolt source. So we should be looking at a volt-ish. Ish. All right, you love that ish. Okay, so put our legend down there. So the generator, right, is this sort of olive color, which is this right here. That's our uh, 300 millivolts, right? So there's 250 right there, 500. So that looks good, 300. Now I have my two outputs, right? The, the green one is V load number two. That was on the opposite collector. I'll kind of move this out of the way, right? That's, that's this one. So that's the one we expected to be in phase, which it is. And then the maroon one is uh, V load number one, right? Which is the same, that's this one, okay? So that's an antiphase, which looks good. A quick inspection of the amplitudes, they look like they are pretty close. And, you know, we are getting the gain that we expect. It's just a little bit under unity for the voltage. And like I said, we were expecting a gain a little over three. So, you know, a gain of three would have given us 900 millivolts. We're expecting a little over that. So, so far, so good, right? Let's check out the... Um, AC analysis over here. And, wow, this looks like one curve. Well, it really is, too. If you look very closely over here, you can see there's a slight deviation at the very high end. These things are so close, they're, like, perfectly overlaid. Right? The deviation between these two things, I would say, is pretty much inconsequential. So we're going up. You know, that's a 1, 2. There's your 3 dB out there. So the 3 dB point on the top end, F2, is above 10 megahertz. On the bottom end, you know, it's just a couple of hertz. So certainly it does have wide, wide bandwidth. The matching on this thing is great. What about the distortion? All right. We do want low distortion. Um, on, the, on the simple one that we did, the, the common collector, common emitter, single transistor, we were up around... Um, 0.8% THD, if I remember correctly, in the in the base unit. So let's see what we get here. And we're at 0 0.066. So we are a little bit better than that. Check the other output. Also 0 0.066. Okay. And the same thing would be true here, is in that if we crank up the currents, the DC currents, the bias currents, uh, we can improve this a little bit because it's a matter of how large is the AC current with respect to the DC current? So, you know, the, the, the smaller the amount of AC swing relative to the DC, the less nonlinearity you're incurring, and consequently the lower the distortion will be. So 0.06% is, you know, decent. It's not super hi-fi. It's not audiophile tweak level, but it's not bad. You know, there's a lot of stereos out there, home stereos, car stereos, that won't match that. So... That's not bad. All right, now, what about this tail current source? Right? I mentioned this earlier, and you're probably thinking, do I really need something that fancy? Hmm, what kind of performance do you want? So let's try it without. All right, so this is the same circuit. It's just that I've replaced the current source with just the power supply and a resistor. Now, remember, the whole reason we have this fancy version over here is because this creates a very high internal impedance. This is a much closer um, ideal current source, right? It's much closer to ideal than this one is. I mean, the internal value of the current source here is just 4.7K. Over here, we are looking at, you know, whatever this transistor internal current source is, which is probably hundreds of K, if not more. All right. Let's do... A, a comparison run on first i'll tell you what let's do it let's do a dc analysis because we do want to make sure that you know we are comparing apples to apples and not apples to kumquats 
So, you know, what do we have for currents and so forth? Okay, well, we are getting 1.988 off this one. Same off the, the one next to it. Um, you know, these voltages were a little over 10. So, yeah, 10.6. All right, so that's, you know, the DC setup is the same. So we're not, we're not cheating in that way. All right, um, we can do a quick transient analysis here. Uh, hey, you know, I'm seeing a little bit of deviation. All right, look closely at those peaks. All right, so there's your VLOAD 2 and there's your VLOAD 1. VLOAD 2 looks like it's um, a little low. You know, I mean, the phase is looking good, but that looks like there's a little bit of a mismatch. Okay. Let's check out the uh, AC analysis here, the Bode plot. And, oh, wow, definitely. All right, there's definitely a, differ a difference here between these two things. Okay, so um, this one is pulling out uh, about 10.3 dB, and this one is pulling out about 9.9 .9 dB. All right, so, you know, we're looking at about a 0.4 dB difference. And that's what you get with the better current source. All right. So definitely an improvement. Yeah, okay, it's getting a little bit more complicated over here. All right. All right, so let's recap. What do we got going on here? Well, it's a little bit more complicated, certainly, but for that level of increased complication, we do have an adjustable gain that can be greater than one. In this case, it was a little over three. We certainly get a decent bandwidth and uh, total harmonic distortion. That looks good. The input impedance is not affected by either load value. That was a problem with the common collector, common emitter version. Okay, so this is not, that's nicely set up. The output impedance are identical. Unfortunately, they're both high value. So the output impedance of this one is this 4.7. For this one, it's this 4.7K. So at least they're balanced. In the common collector, common emitter, they weren't balanced. One was high, one was low. Here, they're balanced, but unfortunately, they're both high. So it, it will not tolerate well unbalanced loads, right? If I got a 2K here and a, you know, a 3K here or something like that, we're going to see a greater mismatch in terms of those gains. So not so, not so great. It does require output coupling capacitors. You might be able to get away without having an input coupling capacitor, all right? Um, and, you know, you could fix some of these things by adding output followers. You know, I could put a follower here and here, in which case uh, the, the tolerance for unbalanced loads would go way up. It would be much better at that. And you'd still get balanced output impedances, but they would be low. Right, they would be low. So it would be a, definitely a, an improvement on this. But now you're up to five transistors. And the, you know, the complexity is really starting to get up there. All right. Okay. Is there another way to do it? Yeah, there is another way to do it. You can use a couple of operational amplifiers. And that's what we'll look, look at in the next video. So, you know, if you have any questions, you know what to do. Leave them down in the comments. Take care and I'll see you next time.